Compared to the 2020 Suburban, the 21 Suburban is just over four inches longer in terms of the wheelbase. The overall length, however, has only grown 1.3 inches, but you get 2.3 more inches of legroom in the second row, 2.2 more inches of legroom in the third row, and you get 2.2 more cubic feet of cargo room behind the third row. In fact, the max cargo room has grown by 23 cubic feet up to 144.7. For the first time ever, both the Tahoe and Suburban get a second row that can slide. It can move up to five and a half inches forward or rearward. The base engine is a 5.3 liter V8. It makes 355 horsepower, and it comes standard on the LS, LT, Z71, RST, and Premier models. This one does not have the 5.3 liter V8 because this is a fancy pants, brand new high country. Instead, we get a 6.2 liter V8, making 420 horsepower. That's better. It's backed up by a 10-speed automatic gearbox, and it makes better noises, too. It also has all of the cylinder deactivation tech. It has active grille shutters. It has all kinds of stuff to help you try and get somewhat decent fuel economy. But if you're buying a Suburban, come on, bro. I mean, it's not a speed demon, but I don't want it to be or expect it to be. If you need something a little quicker, get the Tahoe. Inside though, Chevy has done a damn fine job of fine tuning this chassis. Gone is the live axle outback. Instead, we have a multi-link rear suspension setup, independent rear. This thing feels great. It has magnetic ride control. It has adaptive air suspension. Again, this is a fully spec model, so it is expensive. But I will say, it's quiet, it's comfortable. Yeah, it's big, but it's very easily drivable uh, if you've driven any modern pickup truck. I wish I could sit in the third row to see what the ride is like, because if you've ever driven on a solid axle vehicle, say you've driven in like an airport shuttle bus transport, and you sit in that seat that's on the rear axle and it hits a bump, you feel like you're sh you feel like your spine is going to shoot through the top of your head. I have to imagine it's much better here. One, because it's not a bus shuttle for an airport, but two, switching over to that multi-link independent rear suspension has to help a lot. I like the second row with captain's chairs. There's a pass through there for the third row, but you don't even really need that because you can slide those second row seats far enough forward and then fold them even up out of the way. That is a truly, truly usable third row with still usable space behind it. And if you need to load up tons of stuff, fold everything down. Both gas engines feature industry-first dynamic fuel management technology, which Chevy says offers more than 12 modes of cylinder deactivation designed to optimize the engine efficiency across a broad range of driving conditions, which includes when you're towing with a trailer. That sounds complicated, but useful, but still complicated. There's also an optional diesel engine available. You can get it on every model except the Z71. It's a three liter Duramax inline six, and it makes 277 horsepower, which is yeah, but 460 pound-feet of torque, which is yeah. Standard, Chevy shoves a 10 inch screen in the center stack. A bit crazier in terms of visibility though is the 15 inch head up display. No competitor has one that big. It comes standard on high country and it is available on the Premier trim and I appreciate it. So the RST trim is street style inspired. It's got all of the LT content and it's got 22 inch wheels. Jump to the Z71 and you get a more off-road focused Suburban. The front fascia is different. There's a higher approach angle. Four wheel drive is standard and there's a two speed transfer case with hill descent control. You also swap out to 20 inch wheels with all terrain tires. Chevy bolts on a front skid plate, red tow hooks, because red means off-road, and then there's more black and black chrome exterior accents. The Premier adds magnetic ride control, navigation, the 8-inch diagonal instrument cluster, a premium Bose 10-speaker audio system, 12-way power vented and perforated front bucket seats, and a bunch more safety features, which I guess those lower trims don't need. The high country, though, is new for both the Tahoe and Suburban. It is the top level model. 
It gets a unique grille. It gets bronze accents and high country badging. You've got high country sill plates, seat embroidery, expanded color and trim choices, and the big 6.2 liter comes standard as does magnetic ride control, 22 inch chrome wheels, the head up display system, and you get available air ride adaptive suspension and adaptive cruise control. This is nice. The on-road manners are, are, are very nice. The sound system sounds pretty good. I was bumping Pearl Jam and then before that some reggae and, and it sounded good. The screen here looks a little bit tacked on, which is a bit of a bummer. I wish they could have designed this more to integrate more nicely with the center stack. Uh, but in terms of how it functions and works, it works fine. It works very well, actually. And I'm connected to wireless Apple CarPlay through my Bluetooth connection, and that was a quick, easy setup. And my phone is sitting in a lower section down here in front of the cup holders where it is charging wirelessly. The push button transmission is a little goofy, but you get used to it in two seconds. I say goofy because it's not, not every button is a press. Reverse and drive are a pull, and park and neutral are a press, which is actually smart from a UX design perspective in terms of safety because you know you have to press to put it into park and pull to put it into gear. So you are not mistaking a park or a drive with a neutral. Those are different actions. So I get why they do that and it makes sense there. And then if you want to change to different gears or force it to not go above different gears, there's an L button, which I'm going to assume stands for limit, but I could be wrong because it limits which gear this will climb to with the 10-speed automatic. You can't put it into fifth, but you can limit it from not climbing higher than fifth. Useful for passing on the highway probably or going down grades, especially if you were towing something. But upgrades, this is comfortable. This is nice, and it's expensive, so it should be. It's not insanely expensive. It is not Toyota Land Cruiser expensive, though that has a greater purpose to it, but that vehicle is dated AF. The cheapest way to get into a Suburban, the base Suburban starts right around 57. Okay, I had to stop for a sec because I'm wrong here. The lowest priced Suburban is 51,700. I went off pricing initially that I found on Chevy's website. The 51,700 is for the LS, which isn't available yet. It's just not out. So Chevy had to show pricing for the LT on its website, which is the one that starts at 57. So the LS is coming, it's just following behind. It's the lowest trim option. Most suburban buyers aren't gonna buy the lowest one out there. So they don't need to rush that one to market as much as they do the other trim. So the cheapest one is 51,700. I'm still right on the high end. $58,000. This one, this is a high country. This is fully loaded. Uh, I built one online just to see because I didn't get a Monroney with this one, so I don't know what the actual sticker price of this one would be, but it's probably gonna be 80 to 85 for a fully maxed out one. I think you can build one comfortably in the high 70s as well if you don't go too cuckoo bananas crazy. I personally would drop down a bit if I was gonna buy a Suburban, which I do not need, and 90% of people do not need. But if you actually need a Suburban for towing, and also carrying lots of stuff and people and dogs and groceries in your vehicle, fine. It's a good vehicle for that if you need all of the space. Otherwise, get the Tahoe. But like I said, I'd get the Z71, punch it up a little bit in terms of a, more of an off-road spec. The Suburban on knobby tires is always kind of cool. Um, but this is a hulking beast, but it doesn't necessarily drive like the aging hulking beast it used to be. And this vehicle is an iconic one. I don't, I don't know if you are agreeing with me or disagreeing with me because I cannot see into the future. However, Suburban is the oldest continuous nameplate in automotive history. The Suburban name has been in use for 85 years. It's the oldest one out there. So it's kind of cool that this is still kicking around. I know they don't need to make a modern version of the three-door Suburban, um, but you know what? Uh, it's, it's good that they updated their giant hulking beast of a thing with uh, a better chassis, a more comfortable ride, more tech, more safety features, more niceties for those of us inside, plenty of room for people. So if you have a large family, large dogs, you want to tow something behind this because this is you know mid sevens to high 8,000 pounds for towing all day long um, with ease, especially if you get the diesel. This is a good vehicle for that. 
there's some good competition in the form of the Expedition. This might be a little nicer inside. Again, this is top spec though, but this is pretty nice. It's hard for me to get excited about a Suburban like I do in some of the other reviews, but I will say this is, I, I expected to not care about it at all when they dropped it off, but this is nice. This is really well done. I, I could see taking a very long road trip in this with my wife, my kid, and maybe another couple friend, you know, post COVID restrictions, and everyone being happy and refreshed at the other end of the journey with room for everybody's luggage in back. And then there's even the optional 12.6 inch entertainment screens right here, which are huge for rear seat entertainment. There's a, a set of headphones in here, so I don't have to listen to another goddamn Disney movie. Um, <laughs> just kidding, half, 50, 50, 50 on that. Um, but the soundtracks are driving me insane. Um, I could have some tunes playing up front. They could do something else back there and we'd be good to go and we'd be happy in this giant suburban. It does sound good. I mean, it's a 6.2 liter V8. LS bro! It's the Camaro of the full-size SUV world! Where's my Suburban SS? ZL1. Okay. There's a problem when you have these short-term loans where you, there's things you miss. Um, so I've only been behind the wheel of this for a very short amount of time. And my goal in a first drive review of a vehicle is to try to get you a lot of high level information and then when you have a vehicle for a week that's when you can dive into some of the more nitty gritty more of the detail so one thing i noticed just now and i had to pull the camera out i didn't grab the mic that's why this is just gopro audio but i had to say this um, because it's important um, it relates to the steering tuning driving this around the steering has felt great properly weighted the right amount of heft for a vehicle like this however i noticed when going straight this has that steering tuning where there's like it's steering tuning engineers are trying to eliminate the dead zone in the center of the steering at the top and sometimes when they do that they've basically removed a place for the steering wheel to sit comfortably when you're going straight so it's very subtle but it's there where it's like just slightly left, just slightly right, just slightly left, just slightly right. And when you notice it, it drives you nuts because it's happening constantly. And I noticed this before in other vehicles. It was either the Ford Edge ST or the Infiniti Q60, something else with uh, steering that was good in most cases, but not great. It's when you're, you're, you're here and you just notice there's a slight like that or like that. And it's not that dramatic, it's, it's really, mostly imperceptible but you feel it and as soon as you feel it it drives you nuts and again this goes back to suspension engine suspension not suspension steering engineers steering developers trying to tune out as much of a dead zone as possible in the middle and there's a point where they take it just too far and it's annoying and in fact i think i don't have evidence to back this up i think in the long haul on a highway drive it's probably also needlessly fatiguing uh, I know there was a, a Mazda's had a system that was almost the opposite of that to reduce the amount of corrections in a steering wheel. And this feels like it's adding more corrections and it's annoying and I hate it. Everywhere else, the steering is great, but I'd be remiss if I didn't turn the camera back on and say that. All right, back to the rest of the video. <laughs> Suburban. Okay. So, there's a ton of room back here. Um, what I'm doing is I've stopped, I've pulled over because there are so many stats on this and I only have it for a shirt much. And I only have it for a shirt. Why can I f***ing talk? So I've stopped and pulled over uh, and I'm, I'm sitting back here where there's tons of room. There's really good headroom. I folded down the seat in front of me because I'm a lounger. And I wanted to talk about a few things that I knew I'd miss because I only have this for, for a short amount of time. And there are a handful of things that I wanna make sure I, I get out there in this first experience of the 2021 Chevrolet Suburban. So the air adaptive suspension is available on High Country and Z71 models and delivers automatic load leveling and ride height adjustment. The ride height can be adjusted up to four inches. 
In highway driving, the system automatically lowers the ride height three quarters of an inch to improve aerodynamics and fuel efficiency. You can raise the body for additional ground clearance when driving off-road by one inch at low speeds in four-wheel drive high and an additional inch at lower speeds in four-wheel drive low, which is pretty cool, as long as you're ma not maxing out the travel of the air suspension. So the base 5.3 liter V8 makes 355 horsepower and 383 pound-feet of torque. The better engine, more exciting 6.2 liter V8, which is in this one, makes 420 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. And I already told you about the diesel, which is 277 and 460. And that torque, GM estimates that uh, the full amount of torque is available at 1500 in the turbo diesel. There is a base 18 inch wheel. You're gonna see a lot of 20 inches and then there are optional 22s, though standard on some of the trims like RST and Premier and probably this one. So with the 5.3 liter V8 and the two wheel drive version, the max payload is 1,750 pounds. The standard towing rating is 7,900 pounds and there's a max towing rating of 8,300 pounds, which I assume you get with a trailering package. 5.3 liter four wheel drive, payload is 1,759. You gain nine pounds of payload. Uh, towing drops to 7,700, max towing drops to 8,100. 6.2 liter V8, two wheel drive. Payload is down compared to that one. It's 1,612 pounds for two wheel drive and front wheel drive. The standard towing is 7,800. The max towing is 8,200. The four wheel drive version of the 6.2 liter, the standard towing is 7,500 and the max towing is 7,900. So all of them are right around high sevens to low eights, which is, I mean, that's good. If you need more than that, you jump to uh, a, a heavy duty truck. So if you wanna look at Tahoe versus Suburban in terms of size, the wheelbase on the Tahoe is 120.9 inches, whereas on the Suburban it is 134.1 inches. That's a lot, that's a big difference. The overall length of the Tahoe is 210.7 inches, whereas the Suburban is 225.7 inches. They're almost the same width. Uh, the Tahoe is 81 inches and the Suburban is 81.1, which is probably due to like, like slightly bigger mirrors. Um, the height is almost the same, though the Tahoe is slightly taller. 75.9 inches high for the, 75.9 inches high for the Tahoe, 75.7 for the Suburban. Uh, and the tracks are identical. 68.5 inch track in front, 68.3 inch track in rear. Good, that's probably good. That's a lot of the info.